I will not be talking about performance at all. I will actually be talking about uh, extreme data on a completely different dimension, um, specifically a dimension of time, so very long-lived data. Um, and before I get into this, I should point out that I do not, I did not actually do any of the work I'm about to present. This was all the hard work of uh, NERSC Storage Systems Group, uh, which I am now the acting lead of. So Nick Balthasar and Christy callback rose um, provided much of the material that I'll be presenting here. Um, so, so I work at NERSC, which is the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, and uh, what, what that means in practice is that we are a, a, the Mission Computing Center for the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Science, um, and we have a very diverse workload. So we run, uh, our users run scientific um, simulations, AI workloads, and experimental data analysis at extreme scales across pretty much every science domain. Um, and as a result, we also have a very diverse user base. So in 2018, for example, uh, we had over 7,000 active users, over 700 active projects, 700 different applications. Over the course of that year, our center, including all of our file systems and network uh, ingress and egress, so over, over an exabyte of I.O., and uh, our users have cited us in over, over 2,000 publications per year. Um, but, but more interestingly, uh, we've been operating continuously for the last 46 years. And so what I'll be talking about here is how we manage data that has to live over the course of decades. Um, and this is uh, going to be a growing problem as, as HPC becomes pervasive and the, the data that we're generating nowadays, um, you know, gets carried forward for years or decades. And so at NERSC, we kind of have viewed storage in a pretty typical hierarchy shown here. So at the very top of the canonical storage pyramid, we deploy scratch file systems where our users are expected to store data for weeks or months. This is our high performance storage. Uh, and the way we deploy this is that our scratch storage is only mounted on one supercomputer at a time. Um, so you use that supercomputer and you have access to that one storage system that gives very high performance. Um, we purge data off of this tier, so uh, users don't have any expectation that their important data will be there the next time they need it. Um, so this very much is scratch. And also notably, uh, when we uh, get rid of an old supercomputer, this entire scratch storage system, because it's attached only to that computer, also gets thrown out. And all the data stored on that file system is also discarded at that time. And so this motivates the need for lower storage tiers where, where we don't uh, discard users' data. And so since about 2005, we've had the center-wide file system tier, which we're now calling community storage. This is where users keep their data for on the order of months to years. So this is where their scientific project or campaign, uh, they can store their data there and rely on it being there. Um, this tier is mounted center-wide, so it's mounted on all of the supercomputing resources we have. In addition to, uh, we have web interfaces, so users can put data in a special directory in their project, and it's exposed via HTTP to the world. And then we also have a container infrastructure at NERSC where users can stand up databases and staple services that can help their workflows, and the community file system is also exposed there. Uh, we do not purge this tier, it's subject to quotas instead. That's how we manage capacity on it. And we never delete user data off of this. So even after a scientific campaign ends, um, we instead of deleting their data, we actually push it down to archive, which is the bottom tier of storage that we offer at NERSC. And the archive is what could, where users store data for on the order of years to decades. Um, our archive tier is not mounted anywhere because it's not a file system. We expose it more like an object store. So it has a put get interface, which the majority of our users use to interact with their data there. There is no effective quota. We kind of let users dump as much of whatever they want into it. Um, there is a, a quota and they do have to request for quota extensions or expansions, um, but we typically do not deny any requests for more space. And so in effect, this is kind of our infinite capacity tier. Uh, and the trade-off, of course, is that it also provides the lowest performance since it is currently tape-based. And so, you know, when we talk about high-performance computing, we're usually talking about the scratch tier because this is the really fast place where we put all of our fancy NVMe and we're, we're trying to squeeze every last bit of performance out of. And this is what most of the speakers uh, today have been talking about. Um, but I will talk about kind of the less exciting but equally important part of high-performance computing storage and I'll be talking about these long-lived data tiers. 
and the considerations that uh, are required there. And so to put this, this storage pyramid into actual concrete systems, here's a timeline of NERSC over the last 20 years. Uh, the topmost uh, tier, like I said, is Scratch. And, and also, as I said, we discard these Scratch file systems when we discard supercomputing systems. Um, so every time we, we roll a, a system out to the dumpster, the, the disks or the flash go out with it. Um, the community tier below that uh, has a much less frequent refresh cadence. So we typically refresh Scratch every three to five years when we buy a new supercomputer. Community has been refreshed uh, a few times since 2005 when it, when it was first created at NERSC, um, but we have always rolled data forward. So users have never had to manually copy their data from an old set of community hardware to new community hardware. We manage that for them. And then the archive is even longer lived, and we tend to refresh that uh, every eight to 12 years, say. Um, and again, since we've, we don't ever delete data off of this tier, uh, our archive right now contains data that goes back 43 years, and we have never deleted any user data from this system. Um, so rather than talk about how we manage uh, these long-lived storage systems in theory, I thought I would present this as a series of case studies on, on some of the challenges that we face in the hopes that uh, it would give you all some ideas of uh, what the outstanding problems in a production data facility are uh, and perhaps come up with clever solutions that, that would make our life as a, an HVC operating center easier. So the first case study I'll present is uh, a recent project we had when we recently refreshed the community storage tier. So this is our center-wide file system. Um, what it amounted to is we had what we called the project file system, which was a six petabyte GPFS-based file system built on DDN hardware. And in 28, starting in 2018, we began migrating uh, or planning the migration of all that data and that logical role of that community tier uh, to a new IBM-based uh, GPFS file system, which we called the community file system. And this is about 10 times more capacity than the previous tier that it was replacing. And so the standard way that we upgrade the, this community tier is um, we use features in GPFS to make this very transparent to people. So the way this works in practice is that um, we will get a new disk array or a new rack of disk arrays we will install them and we will configure them into the existing GPFS file system. Um, if we have old arrays that we're retiring out, we can just use a very simple GPFS specific command to drain those arrays. Um, and what that does is it evacuates all of the blocks that are on those arrays that we want to get rid of and transparently and asynchronously copies them across the other remaining arrays. Um, and so this happens completely uh, transparently to users. There is a slight performance impact of doing this because you are reading and writing a bunch of data, but because this is not a high performance file system, it's a high capacity file system, um, that's not really noteworthy. And so this is a, a really nice flexible way to add capacity or remove capacity if needed from this file system without users ever knowing that this is happening. And we do this on a regular basis. And it, it's so routine that we don't even make user announcements that we're, we're expanding the file system. Unfortunately, when we replaced the project file system, that DDN file system with the IBM file system, we could not do this because the new file system, by virtue of the fact that it was so much larger than the previous file system, had a, a weak we stood to gain for optimizations from uh, changing the block level layout on disk. So the way the data is arranged on disk had to change, which meant we had to copy everything at the file level and rewrite it to the new hardware through the file interface so that the underlying data layout on the block devices uh, would match uh, the new option configuration. And so we considered a number of, of options on how we could manage this migration. So we had six petabytes of data that we needed to transparently migrate uh, to this new hardware. Um, the first option we considered was just making the users do it themself, themselves. This is a pretty attractive option for us because we don't have to do anything. We just tell users, hey, this old file system is going away. So if you really want your data on there, you're going to have to copy it yourself. Um, and it also had the, the potential benefit that users would be incentivized to look through their data and actually discard things that they didn't actually need. Um, unfortunately, this is completely non-transparent. Um, and furthermore, really long-lived data tends to change ownership in ways that doesn't map nicely to a single user. So a project might last for 10 years, but the users who, who own the POSIX files on that file system 
may lo no longer exist. So it's difficult to establish who is responsible for moving that project data. Um, and in practice, when we've done this in the past, what happens is no one moves their data until the day before the file system goes away. And then suddenly everyone is trying to move their piece of that six petabytes within a 24 hour window before it gets deleted. And it causes way more problems than, than it really solves on our part. So we, we decided not to go this route pretty early on. Um, a better option is to use bespoke uh, utilities that are meant to do large data migrations in parallel. Um, there are a number of tools for this that exist. Unfortunately, due to the project timeline, we did not have very long to uh, do this data migration. We had about a month, and this was the month of December. So this was going to happen over the holidays. And so we felt that uh, our, by virtue of the fact that the data on this file system had been kicking around since 2005 in some cases, um, there's a lot of weird stuff that users had on there. For example, there were some users with file names that had like the pipe character in the file name, new line characters, just weird stuff like that. And we were very worried that some of these uh, bespoke tools like MPI file utils or Globus would not behave correctly when they encounter these really strange files. And so we, in the end, we just didn't feel we had enough time to thoroughly test um, all these special made tools uh, at scale uh, without being absolutely sure we wouldn't lose data. So we opted not to do this. And instead, we took uh, kind of the, the least glamorous and really not a, a very sh highly recommended route um, where we took standard Linux or standard Unix tools uh, and assembled them in clever ways to do a parallel data transfer ourselves. So this had the upside that uh, these tools are used not just by HPC, they're used around the world. So they can handle all these weird edge cases. So we were sure that the data would be safely migrated and done so correctly, but it meant that our engineers had to spend a lot of time stitching together a process to do this migration. And so what happened in the end was that we spent uh, about 14 days doing a single bulk transfer of six petabytes. Um, we took a snapshot. Um, after that 14 days, we got you know, this snapshot of the file system migrated from the old DDN hardware to the IBM hardware. And then we started doing nightly uh, resyncs using rsync, uh, highly parallelized, to make sure that we were keeping up to date. And then finally, we had a center-wide outage that happened to coincide with regular maintenance. And we took a 12-hour outage to do a final sync uh, of all the data. And then after that, we discarded the old DDN file system. We remounted the new community file system based on the IBM platform. Uh, and users were frankly none the wiser. All they knew was suddenly their six petabytes went up to 64 petabytes. And everything went uh, without a hitch, um, as it should, but it was a tremendous amount of effort. So what we learned from this process is that um, doing these forklift upgrades are, are really a lot of work. And it's not a good practice to do this for uh, systems that have long-lived data. Because it really, it takes months of migration testing. Uh, it takes an outage to do the, the final cutover. Um, and in our case, you know, if there was a, a change in the block level layout, which we had, it meant doing a lot of file level copies. We couldn't use the nice file system migration tools like Drain and Restripe as we normally had. Uh, that said, tools like Draining and, and Restriping are essential if you want to have a long lived file system uh, like this. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that um, considering the granularity at which you can drain individual uh, building blocks of storage is very important. Um, so typically, you can drain a single RAID array. Um, in the case of the new IBM system, we actually have a single rack as a, a unit of draining and restriping. So we can only drain 11 petabytes of data at a time. So if we need to service a rack long term, we have to drain 11 petabytes out of it, pull the whole rack out of service. Um, that was a conscious cost decision, the way we architected the system. Um, but fine grained is really preferable when doing this because it means you can you could uh, upgrade and and uh, in much smaller increments, and it's potentially uh, much shorter and much less disruptive. Uh, so that was the disk-based file system case. And now I'll talk about the tier below that, the archive. So uh, just as we refreshed our, our disk-based file system recently, uh, it just so happens at the same time, a different part of the team also had to change the tape libraries that we use and migrate all of the data off of an old uh, set of Oracle libraries onto a brand new set of IBM-based uh, tape libraries. Um, and this was motivated largely because Oracle had dropped support for its libraries. So we had 150 petabytes on an Oracle-based tape technology that was no longer uh, under support. And so we really needed to, to move all of the data onto the IBM technology at that point. 
Um, so again, usually what we do when we add capacity and grow this tier, it's, it's a very straightforward process in the world of tape. Um, so what usually happens is we rely on this uh, process called repack where we buy uh, a couple pallets of tape cartridges. So every quarter we buy six of these pallets shown here, uh, about 3,000 cartridges. We load them into the library. Um, we tell the robots put these tapes away. Uh, the tapes get put into the slots and then behind the scenes, um, our archival software will take low density tapes of the previous technology, pull all the data off of that and repack it onto higher density tapes. And this is all completely transparent. It's done all online. Uh, and it's really a non-event. We do this on a continuous basis. Um, and this allows us to expand the, the tape infrastructure with very fine granularity. And so in practice, like I said, we buy new tape cartridges every quarter. Uh, we buy new tape drives. So these are what the cartridges are, are read and written using every um, two to four years. And then the libraries, which contain the robotics and the, and the drives and, and handle all of the moving of the tapes around, we refresh you know, typically every five to 10 years. And it's also worth pointing out that we specifically use enterprise tape at NERSC for this because everything is backwards compatible. So you can take an old generation tape with and use it with a new generation drive. You can use a new generation mm -hmm. tape um, with a newer generation library. All of this stuff is very interchangeable and that is not the case at LTO. So we rely heavily uh, on the, the enterprise features of enterprise tape in our, in our case. Uh, again, you know, the, the way we usually do things is not how we, we had to do this uh, big upgrade from the Oracle libraries to the IBM libraries. Um, like I said, the Oracle drives and libraries are out of support, so there's a critical time urgency to get our data off of this. Um, we, so we relied on our archival software uh, features. So we use HPSS, which is able to talk to both Oracle and IBM drives and handle those libraries and robotics. Um, it's also worth noting that when you have to repack 150 petabytes worth of tapes onto new tapes, this takes months to years. So this cannot be an offline process. You have to do this online because you cannot take your archive off, offline for, for years to do this. Um, and so the strategy that we took is we, we froze the state of our old libraries to make sure no new data was going to it. And then we gradually started migrating data off of that as new incoming data was written directly to IBM based technology. And so the way this looked in practice, this is a timeline of that process. Um, let's see here. Uh, so uh, very early on, we just happened to have an older model IBM library kicking around. So what we did was we unplugged the fire hose of data coming into our tape libraries from our users, from the old Oracle libraries, we plugged them into the IBM libraries so that at least um, we were not, this was only for small files. Um, and then we used uh, the time that followed that to commission our big IBM libraries. And that commissioning process took about a year. But once our new tape libraries were online, we could then unplug the other fire hoses from the Oracle libraries and completely turn that Oracle library uh, set into a read-only resource. And then um, with all of the new data going directly to IBM technology, we could then take our time to repack all the Oracle-based tapes into IBM-based tapes. And we did this using a combination of uh, over-the-wire network-based repack, as well as good old-fashioned sneaker net. Um, so when the sneaker net component of this migration uh, literally involved taking 3,000 IBM cartridges out of our older library, uh, this was the first firehose redirect that we did, which was about 30 petabytes. And over the course of 15 days, you know, Owen, shown here in the top right, uh, pulled all those tapes out of one library and put them into another one. And he did this for 3,000 cartridges. And for the remaining 121 petabytes of user data, uh, we repacked over the wire. And this uh, plot on the bottom shows our, our daily uh, repack rate. And so we spent the better part of a year repacking about 300 terabytes of, of tapes per day. And then uh, in the third and fourth quarter of 2019, we dialed that up a little bit and, and we're packing half a petabyte of tape per day over the network. Um, what was interesting to me when I first became involved in this project as, as uh, you know, the, the manager of the cleanup is that uh, you know, when you have 150 petabytes of data that goes back 40 something years, you kind of know that you know, when you have to read it all, you might not be able to get all of it back. I mean, there's going to be data loss. And so, um, you know, we, we expected this because we just know that we can't uh, raid 
across tapes. Uh, it's just uh, very difficult to do that. And we only replicate small files because we can't afford to replicate all the big files. And so what really happens is uh, individual tape cartridges often are the only single copy of data. And we rely on the intrinsic parity uh, and robustness of enterprise tape, which has a very, very good uh, uncorrectable bit error rate uh, to protect our data. So at the end of this 150 petabyte data migration, uh, what, what wound up happening was we had lost 22 terabytes over about 2,000 files. So those were just unreadable. Um, but in, in the context of the fact that we had 151 petabytes and 230 million files, um, you know, the amount of data that we lost was on the order of parts per million. And this affected 148 users. Um, and there was also weird stuff that happened, like you know, really old tape cartridges, the stickers just start peeling off, which is what's shown here. And so a person needs to go in and see that a sticker is falling off, and that's why a robot can't find that tape. And so there's a bit of manual effort involved in here. And so it's not you know, this free process like it might be with a disk. You, you, there is hands-on time required. Uh, the sources for the data loss uh, were pretty well understood. And so the vast majority of the data that we, was unrecoverable turned out to be caused by bad firmware on tape drives that was introduced in 2011. And so what was happening was the tape drives were actually um, moving their read heads or their write heads uh, a little too aggressively and were effectively poking holes in cartridges. Um, and this you know, was corrected, but you know, once a dimple is punched into a tape, that data is kind of gone forever. Um, and so we were able to recover most of the data on these tapes because it only messed up a small portion of you know, upwards of a kilometer worth of tape in each cartridge. Um, but there was unreadable data. And 81 out of the 90 cartridges that were damaged uh, were attributed directly to that one bad firmware event. Um, and then there were nine more that, that simply we don't know what happened to them, but uh, they wound up being unreadable in part or in full. Um, so I have talked about um, migrating generations of media. So we talked about a file system, a disk-based file system, and tape. Um, but the reality is over the course of 40 years, uh, typically you often have to move data centers. And so NERSC has been around for 46 years, as I've said, and we've actually moved four times since our founding. So this is four completely new data centers. Um, and the good news here is that uh, these are actually pretty dis non-disruptive in terms of migrating user data. And so I told you about the uh, tape archive refresh where we had to repack all these tapes. What I didn't tell you is that uh, the Oracle libraries, which we had to get data out of, and the IBM libraries that we're putting the data into were actually separated by six miles um, because we did this as a result of moving in part uh, from our Oakland facility um, to our to Berkeley Lab, which is up in the Berkeley Hills. Um, and so I said we used SneakerNet to move 30 petabytes, and that really uh, was trucks. We were loading up three petabytes worth of tapes on a truck um, and shipping that truck six miles. And you know, if you want to do the math, uh, it, it comes up with this fun number of 100 gigabytes per second, because we took eight hours to move three petabytes on the back of a truck. Um, and then the stuff that we repacked over the wire, we actually used the first production 400 gig Ethernet uh, loop to do that. So we had very solid networking that allowed us to do that. And again, we relied on archival storage software features to allow us to do that. So HPSS allowed us to repack over Ethernet. Um, and there's also weird stuff, like if someone asks for data and that data is on a cartridge that's in a box in the back of a truck, um, either you get an IO error because the archival software doesn't know how to handle that. In the case, case of HPSS, it actually exposed enough features where we could handle that correctly and users would get a meaningful message saying, you know, we'll get your data for you once it's loaded off of the truck that it's currently on. File system migration is very much the same case. So I told you that um, we typically do these transparent restripes to expand the file system. And when we moved from Oakland to Berkeley Lab uh, up in the Berkeley Hills, this is exactly what we did. So we had a portion of our file system in Oakland, a portion of it in Berkeley, and we just used our 400 gig uh, loop to repack over the wire. Um, there was a little bit of trickiness involved because the GPFS is based on InfiniBand, but our 400 gig was Ethernet. So we used VIOS based routers in parallel to do the protocol conversion from InfiniBand to Ethernet. Um, but it, it worked, it worked at very high performance, and we got this repack done in, or this restrict done in pretty short order. Again, completely online. Users didn't know what was going on until it was over. Um, and it was, it was completely transparent, and we didn't lose any data doing this. 
So wrapping up for it quickly, um, there's a couple takeaways or a couple high level themes that I just wanted to bring to the surface here. Um, so, you know, in these long lived data centers like NERSC, uh, data lives longer than hardware, which means long term storage must be upgradable. And that has to be part of the plan when you design a long lived storage system. Um, you must, this means that you must be able to change hardware without altering metadata, uh, specifically file paths. If a user doesn't know where his or her file is because it's location moved because you are mounting something in a different place or you move data into a different uh, location, that's not very helpful. And so what this really means is that uh, data migration for these long-lived storage systems really must be done transparently uh, instead of this forklift-based approach that we would use for our scratch file systems. So given that we don't want to do forklift upgrades for long-lived storage systems, what does this mean? It means we should use fine-grained piecewise upgrades instead. Uh, and more granularity is better. So good is being able to upgrade a rated LAN at a time or controllers or enclosures or servers independently. Better than that is if we can upgrade individual drives instead of having to swap out a whole RAID LAN. Uh, even better than that is being able to upgrade the media, the drives, and the enclosures all separately, as you can do in the case of tape. And even better than best is if you can also just rip out an entire data center uh, and do a migration without uh, without really noticing it. And so really what this all amounts to is a really good archival long-term storage system has to be aware of all of these levels of granularity. So strong networking is, is very helpful because it allows you to disaggregate all of your storage devices uh, without compromising parity and data protection. Um, and then this disaggregation allows you to use things like network erasure, fail in place, geo-distributed data and parity, which is what allowed us to do uh, the migration from Oakland to Berkeley, for example, um, because the file system supported being able to do that parity over the wire. Um, geo-distribution really makes data center migration easy because you know, suddenly it, you can have data in two completely different places and that's just you know whether they're a rack row away or they're six miles away. Uh, the storage system handles um, network-based parity and things like that, um, you're already covered. Uh, and finally, manageability is a first-class feature. So, you know, we like to talk about performance and in, in high-performance computing storage, um, but for long-lived data, it really needs to be uh, a manageable system, and it needs to support all the features like live repack and restripe, uh, both for online maintenance and break fix, but for these bigger um, data migration and upgrade processes when your, your data needs to live beyond the lifetime of hardware. Um, and finally, data migration over Ethernet is, uh, is a great benefit. Um, so, you know, being able to RAID across SAS is great, but being able to RAID or erasure code across Ethernet is even better because it gives you much more flexibility to run long haul and connect multiple data centers and, and RAID or parity protect across them. And with that, thank you for your time. Uh, and like I said, it was a, a dedicated team of engineers who did all of this work uh, shown here. And uh, finally, I'd like to say uh, we're hiring. So if you're interested in working on these sorts of systems, uh, please click that link or let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. That's a really nice long-term perspective that uh, we usually don't get to see. Uh, does anybody have any questions initially? We have applause. So Glenn, I'll, I'll ask one that uh, has come up. There's been, um, I think, in some people's minds, some hopeful discussions about potentially having disk replace tape. Um, based on your presentation here, I'd say that um, the more well-informed people that say tape is such a superior technology that they are not looking forward to the data and have to switch to disk are probably uh, better informed. What's your opinion on that topic? So I, what I didn't talk about at all here is cost. Um, I, I had a slide with some dollar figures on it, but what it amounts to is tape is still two times cheaper. There's a very rich software ecosystem around tape uh, that frankly doesn't really exist around disk for really long-term uh, data protection. And so your best uh, archival storage that's based on disk is you know, your traditional object store, which has a distributed key value store as its metadata, for example, and does network erasure, and that's good, um, but you know, per gigabyte, you're still spending at least two times more, um, and it's you know, you don't have the robotics, you don't have the the automation that allows you to you know really rip out stuff and replace stuff uh, very easily. Instead, you know, object stores, the best of them, rely on fail in place, 
so that when you just let, you know, when enough disks in a rack rot, you just rip the whole rack out. And that works at extreme scale, um, but it is expensive and uh, that doesn't scale down very well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anybody else have any questions? We've had a lot of applause. Oh wait, John Thomas has one. Why don't you go ahead and go ahead. Yes, and so I have a question right to you on uh, system migration. Um, so do you think that end users, they will accept that while you are uh, doing a, a file system migration, the performance of the file system may be degraded? Or is this something which is unacceptable for them? So the, this is acceptable in our case because the, the only file systems that we carry data forward on are not high performance file systems. I mean, in the absolute scale, they are. So our community file system does over 150 gigabytes per second, and which by many measures is high performance. Um, but you know, our, our production scratch file system does five terabytes per second. Um, so it's just kind of understood by users that if you really want performance, you really shouldn't be looking at the medium term community storage tier. And so whatever performance that tier gets you, is, you're going to have to accept it because if you're after performance, you shouldn't be using that in the first place. Okay, thanks. So Trevor, uh, can you uh, chime in? Trevor may not have audio. So uh, Trevor's asking, can you comment on the motivation for switching between file systems and why GPFS? So GPFS supports Restripe as uh, it just makes data migration really, really easy. And we've come to rely hopelessly on that to avoid downtimes. Um, so we, we didn't switch file systems. We always kept GPFS. We just switched the hardware platforms. And that was just done on a, you know, an open RFP competitive basis. So it was a largely business decision. All right. Thank you. Um, I think we're about out of time. So uh, thank you again. This was a very informative talk and the uh, chat room is having a great time applauding you. So uh, thank you again. And I think we're going to move on to our next speaker.